If you're a woman and you've ever asked yourself these two questions, should I be on hormone replacement at my age? And at what age should I come off hormone replacement? Please take a listen to this because really there are two big issues here. And we get this question all the time. But the two big issues that we need to talk about are, number one, is hormone replacement natural? And two, is long-term use of hormone replacement therapy risky? Now, as a fellowship-trained, anti-aging, functional medicine physician, I speak to this every day in my practice. The long-term evidence on longevity is kind of iffy at best. There are some studies that suggest some things that we can do from a longevity perspective, but truthfully, longevity research in humans is very difficult because the studies would obviously have to go on for 100 years. So we don't have time to wait for that. So we have to do the best that we can with the evidence that we have. So a new publication just came out this month that I wanna talk about. It really helps us navigate the question specifically around hormone replacement therapy and long-term use. Now it's not a perfect study and I'll show you how to avoid some of the potential pitfalls in this kind of research. But if you're considering or if you are on HRT and you're talking to your doctors about how long you can use it, you do need to know this data so that you can have an up-to-date risk and benefit conversation with your provider. So speaking of concerns around hormone replacement, I would love to know what your biggest concerns are around hormone replacement therapy. What is your biggest fear around using hormones? And if you're watching this on YouTube, if you could leave a comment, if you're open to it and letting us know what your biggest concerns are, because this will help us to create content that will really help the most people who are watching this channel. All right, so the study that just came out this month in the Journal of Menopause is a big study looking at long-term implications of taking HRT. So let me give you the big picture takeaways, but definitely stick around to the end because papers like this must be understood and taken into context of what they are. We definitely don't wanna just read the abstract of this one and then walk away with recommendations on what to do. So the big picture takeaway is this. This is a study that compared never users or those that had stopped estrogen versus those that continue to use estrogen beyond the age of 65. Now they broke down different types of estrogen and different combinations and we'll get into all the details. But the big picture here is this. For those that maintained their hormone replacement therapy, there was a reduction of risk in mortality of almost 20%, that's death. Breast cancer, almost 16%. Lung cancer, 13%. Colorectal cancer, 12%. And on and on and on, including heart attack of 11% and dementia of 2%. So what does this mean? It means that for all the women who are told to stop their hormone replacement therapy after 10 years or five years, depending on the doctor, forced to suffer going through menopause again, a second time, this is evidence that could potentially provoke a conversation around an alternative viewpoint, an alternative option to continue to take HRT past the age of 65. Remember that hormone replacement therapy is always a risk benefit analysis, just like any drug, surgery, supplement, or any other intervention that you wanna provide for your body. But you have to understand both the risks and the benefits in order to be able to have that conversation. And unfortunately, in the space of hormone replacement therapy, which is so controversial and so polarizing, a lot of doctors are not doing their due diligence to continue to learn about the updated data that has come out over the last 25 years. Now, to be clear, this is not really a change for me. We have always supported women continuing hormone replacement therapy regardless of chronologic age unless some event provoked a change in the risk benefit analysis. Now, the second critical takeaway here from this study is that it looks like if you add estrogen plus progestin, the synthetic progesterones or progestogens in different forms, together increase the risk of breast cancer. Now, I just said that estrogen decreases the risk of breast cancer. This is another example where the progestin seemed to be the guilty party when it comes to an increased risk of breast cancer. Now we have seen that not any more clearly than in the Women's Health Initiative. So this goes back to you know 2002 and 2004 when the two uh, hormone replacement therapy arms of the, the Women's Health Initiative were published. Just this month, another study was published by the Women's Health Initiative that showed a comprehensive discussion of all the 20 year follow-up since the 2004 publication. And so what we see in this, in this most recent study supports the study I'm talking about today, which is that estrogen is clearly protective of breast cancer and combined therapy clearly increases your risk of breast cancer. What's interesting though, is that when you look in the study that I'm talking about today, this study looking at maintaining or stopping hormone replacement therapy after the age of 65, the authors suggest that the increased risk of breast cancer in combined therapy can be avoided by using a low dose transdermal or vaginal estrogen. Doesn't that seem a little 
contradictory. So they're clearly saying that combined therapy increases the risk of breast cancer and estrogen therapy decreases the risk of breast cancer. But yet, to decrease the risk of breast cancer, you can, should consider using a topical low-dose estrogen or vaginal estrogen. And this is one of those disconnects that I see happen over and over again in people that are coming into the hormone replacement discussion with bias. Clearly, the bias of the authors must be that they are, they are still blaming estrogen for the risk of breast cancer. Otherwise, why would they say that it's beneficial to reduce your estrogen dose to as low as possible to avoid the risk of breast cancer when their data just showed the opposite? Their data just showed that estrogen was protective of breast cancer. So this disconnect is something that is a weakness of this study, and it's a weakness of a lot of studies when the recommendations from the authors don't really jive with the data that's being presented. So now another an important point here is that they talk about progesterone versus progestin. And there's some very clear data here around which is going to have a, a protective effect, which is potentially going to have a harmful effect. So let me just walk through some of these because some of these are actually pretty surprising. So one of the only negative effects of micronized progesterone over a progestin, the synthetic progestin, is this increased risk of endometrial cancer, which I've never seen in a study before. So this is kind of interesting. Um, so that 33% increased risk of endometrial cancer is concerning, and it's something that we should probably look at. But look at the rest of these associations. Progesterone with lung cancer is associated with a 19% reduction in risk. Progestin, 14% increased risk. Uh, cardiovascular disease, protection from progesterone, increased risk from progestin. So when you take all of these things into consideration, they talk in this study about the fact that dose and route matter, that lower dose is better, transdermal or vaginal is safer, and you don't want to use oral estrogen. So some interesting takeaways. But I could see where this would be really confusing if you're a provider that's especially just reading the abstract, because you're not going to see all of the potential flaws of this study. And if you don't look at the data yourself, you could potentially be misled as to what would likely be best, in my opinion, for a woman not only after the age of 65, but certainly after the age of 65, but throughout the perimenopause and menopause timeframe for hormone replacement therapy. All right, before we get to that, if you're having a hard time putting together your comprehensive program for bone health, consider joining our masterclass. This is a free class where I go through our approach at putting together customized programs for individuals. We leave about 15 minutes for Q&A at the end, take about 45 minutes to go through what a program looks like and how we do it. And we spend a lot of time talking about things that you can do on your own. So if you haven't gone through that, I would strongly encourage you to uh, look for that. The link to sign up for that is in the description below. All right, so what are the weaknesses of this kind of study? And this is really important. Again, if you're gonna look at this study as a provider and you're gonna have this conversation with a patient. So some obvious weaknesses are, it's a retrospective study, meaning that they didn't look at a group of people, assign them to an intervention and then follow them over time. So it's retrospective, they're looking backwards in time, and that's always gonna have some bias and weakness. It's also based off of an insurance database. So what that means is it's only going to show commercial products, because these are things that are getting reimbursed by insurance. And because of that, it's going to be biased against anyone who's using bioidentical hormones, who's getting that from a compounding pharmacy or anybody who's not getting insurance reimbursement for their hormone replacement therapy, which is a lot of people. So here are the issues that I see. We don't see any discussion of fracture. We don't know where all that went in this conversation around longevity. Uh, personal preference of mine to always talk about the benefits of fracture with different things. That's not in here. We see in the long-term follow-up from the Women's Health Initiative that estrogen loses its protection over time. Why would that be? Well, they comment in this study that I'm talking about, they talk about the, that low, medium, and high doses of estrogen are potentially concerning, but the problem is, is that there are really no commercial preparations that are actually high dose. They're really all low dose compared to strengths that would likely drive systemic levels to the level that you would need to impact bone, certainly not even close to physiologic levels. So we don't really know how these products were being used, right? Because this is just an insurance database. We don't even know if they were being used. Just because somebody has prescribed something doesn't mean they actually pick it up. Additionally, the scripts are likely going to be removed from somebody's med list if they were to develop a disease. So let's say somebody, you know, developed dementia and they no longer were requesting their hormone replacement therapy and their doctor thought, eh, I should pull you off of this. Well, they're no longer going to have that script, but these data may not actually capture what's happening with that patient. So it's really hard to know, you know, what's happening with the patient when we're just looking at the prescriptions. So does it nullify the entire study? No, there's still definitely takeaways, but we do have to take this into context and we have to add this into the nuance again of the recommendations we're making around hormone replacement. 
So from my perspective, the takeaways from this study are that hormone replacement therapy does not likely increase risk just with chronologic age. This study should be used to make a hypothesis, just like all studies that are retrospective and observational in nature. We can see associations and that's great, so we should make a hypothesis, but then you have to study that hypothesis with a prospective study, preferably a randomized placebo-controlled trial if you're using an intervention like HRT. So I'm concerned that people are gonna use a study like this to then change their recommendations around hormone replacement therapy, potentially for the worse, in my opinion, but we need intervention studies to really answer these questions definitively. So this study actually doesn't change my practice, honestly, at all. But it does empower consumers to have a conversation with their provider as they reach the 60, 65 year old age range. This is a lot of my patients. And I hear over and over again that their providers are pulling them off of hormone replacement therapy because it, now it's too dangerous. But this is another study that can support the idea that we don't need to come off of hormone replacement therapy as a woman as you age. The recommendations are not supported by the literature to come off. We need to get over this fear, this this uh, illogical fear around estrogen with aging and recognize that estrogen is protective of the majority of the chronic diseases that can develop with age. So I hope that made sense. And if you liked this one, you might consider this video on estrogen dosing. And this is another one talking about physiologic versus low dose versus vaginal and some of the recommendations that we're hearing from other providers. And then we also have another video specifically on estrogen and breast cancer that you may wanna check out if you have fears around breast cancer and estrogen as well. So remember that osteoporosis isn't the end, but deciding to reverse it is a beginning. I'll see you in the next video.